Hello, I'm Danny, and this is my video on the labour market, demand and supply. I think labour is one of the most interesting topics, so hopefully this video will be interesting, or otherwise just go to sleep for a bit, I guess. Here are a few definitions for labour. So derived demand for labour is basically when the demand for labour comes from demand for its output. So say Bob is selling ice creams. You don't demand Bob, you demand the ice creams. If demand for ice creams increases, then Bob might have to employ other people. So it might be Bob and James and Jonathan all selling ice cream. So the demand for John and James and Jonathan or Bob or whatever their names were comes from the demand for the good they're selling, for the good, the ice cream, basically. Aggregate demand is basically the total demand for labour in the economy. It tends to depend on the level of economic activity going on. So if you've got a growing economy, lots of economic growth and confidence, you tend to see a rise in employment. Whereas if you're seeing underconfidence, maybe because there's a fall in output and that sort of thing, it tends to be linked to unemployment. Finally, the individual firm's demand for labour depends on a number of factors, including the price of labour, productivity, which is output per worker per period of time. Obviously, if you've got more productive workers, you're going to demand them more, you're going to want more productive workers. Price of alternative factors of production, so you could hire John or you could buy a machine that might do what John does. Whether you hire John or not might depend on the price of the machine. And supplementary labour costs, for example, national insurance. It's not just the wage that you have to pay, you also have to pay a few other things as well. Marginal productivity theory is definitely something really good to get to grips with. Marginal productivity theory basically states that demand for workers depends on their MRP, where MRP is equal to their marginal revenue product, which is basically the extra value of output arising from hiring an additional labour unit. You calculate it by multiplying a worker's marginal product by their marginal revenue. Uh, incidentally, the sort of equilibrium occurs when MRP equals MCL, where MCL is the marginal cost of taking on an additional labour unit. It's important to note that the marginal labour cost uh, might not be the extra amount that you pay them, but it could also take into account the fact that if you buy an extra worker, you're probably going to have to give your other workers a rise in pay, if that makes sense. So say you're hiring cleaners. If you're hiring two cleaners, you can get a supply of two cleaners at £5 an hour. That's actually illegal, so don't do that. Uh, but if you want to hire three cleaners, you're going to have to increase the wage you're prepared to pay to £6 an hour, and you're going to have to pay that to all the workers. You can't just pay it to the additional worker. So you're going to pay all the workers £6. This diagram basically shows that the marginal revenue product curve of labour is equal to the demand curve for labour. So that downward sort of curve slope there is the demand curve for labour. And then across we can see the different wage rates. So if you look across there, we're going to employ when the wage rate, which is the same as the marginal cost of employing the extra worker, essentially, is equal to the MRP. So if we've got a higher marginal cost, then we're going to employ fewer workers. Here's a very simple diagram showing that if the marginal revenue product of labour increases, there's going to be an increase in demand for the labour because it's essentially worth more. This could happen because it has an increase in productivity, or if marginal product or marginal revenue increases. Now let's look at the elasticity of demand for labour. The elasticity of demand for labour is the responsiveness of quantity demanded of labour to a change in the wage rate. You calculate it by doing the percentage change in quantity of labour demanded divided by the percentage change in the wage rate and it's influenced by a number of factors as you can see there. The first one is time period. Essentially the elasticity of demand is higher in the long run because in the long run it's much easier to trade John for a machine whereas in the short run workers might have contracts and stuff which means that you've got to keep them regardless of wage rates and stuff like that. The next one is substitutes. If there's more substitutes for labour, like machines, or just other workers, there's going to be a higher elasticity of demand for them. The next one is the price elasticity of demand of the product. If there's an inelastic demand for the product, there's going to be inelastic demand for labour, whereas if there's elastic demand for the product, there's going to be elastic demand for the labour. This is because if you have an increase in the wage rate, this is going to massively increase the costs of production, which is going to make there be a fall in demand for your product if it's elastic, which is why there's sort of the correlations working there. And the last one is the proportion of the labour cost uh, to the total cost, sort of, a comparison. So the larger the proportion of the labour cost to the total cost basically means there's going to be a higher elasticity because any increase in the wage bill is going to have a significant effect on costs. Let's look at the supply of labour now, it means we're about halfway through the video, woohoo. 
Here are a couple of quick definitions, you're probably familiar with them already. Participation slash activity rate is basically the percentage of the population of working age in work or actively seeking work. It's about 75% in the UK, which is pretty good. There's some people that obviously aren't going to be seeking work, these are the economically inactive. They might want to be housewives, house husbands, they might have other problems. That's not a problem being housewife, house husband, but you might have got a problem or there might be a reason why you don't want to seek work. So here are two very nice terms you can just shove into an essay and they might look good I guess. Now let's look at the supply of labour to a particular occupation. People are attracted to jobs by both monetary and non-monetary factors. The names are pretty self-explanatory but basically monetary factors are any financial rewards for an occupation. So wage, commission, bonuses, anything to do with money. And obviously people want a job with a higher wage rate in general. Whereas non-monetary factors are any non-financial rewards for a particular occupation. So here's a lovely list of them there. Convenient, status, promotion prospects, job security, working conditions, holiday or leisure time, obviously teachers loads of holiday, also a lot of work, perks, fringe benefits and job satisfaction. Job satisfaction tends to be linked to stuff like medicine, teaching, that sort of thing, but anything where you feel as though your work is valued, which is often where you get diseconomies of scale, because in larger companies, workers feel more isolated from what's going on, they feel their work is less valuable, whereas smaller uh, companies, people feel very hands-on, so they have more job satisfaction quite often. At the bottom there on the left we have a diagram showing net advantage, which was a theory by Mr Adam Smith, you've probably heard of him, wrote a really important book, published in 1776, The Wealth of Nations, win, just check that date and it was right, on a roll today. Anyway, that diagram down there shows net advantage, the blue line is the line which basically shows a job with no non-monetary factors, whereas the green line shows the impact of adding non-monetary advantages such as those shown on the right there. And as you can see there's basically an increase in uh, supply of labour if you add in some non-monetary advantages. Um, yeah, and you can also see the wage rates there. So when there's no non-monetary advantages, firms have got to pay a higher wage in order to sort of supplement this and balance it out. Whereas if you've got non-monetary advantages, you often get a lower wage rate. So people like teachers get less pay because they've got longer holidays. You also get less pay for other reasons as well. But that's just a few examples there. That was a massive lie, there was only one example there, but oh well. Here are some factors which influence the supply of labour to a particular firm. So uh, this is going to be in addition to any factors influencing the supply of labour to a particular occupation, so job satisfaction is a big one for certain occupations, stuff like that, anything vocational will attract people to particular occupations. But here are stuff for particular firms. So training, if a firm offers high quality or quantity of training, they're often more attractive, especially to people that have just graduated and who want to sort of get their foot on the ladder and get experience and stuff like that. Location, so people in cities with transport links have got a great supply of labour simply because people are more able to get there. Unemployment, it's much harder to find skilled labour when unemployment is low. So say you're a firm and you've located in an area of high unemployment, you're much more likely to get labour coming in than if you're located in an area of low unemployment. Overtime. If you offer opportunity for overtime, you've often got a higher labour supply. And whilst I'm talking about overtime, I'm going to talk about flexible working as well. If you offer the opportunity for part-time work and stuff like that, you'll often get a higher supply, particularly with young parents wanting to get jobs or people that are older wanting to start weaning off. And the last one is wage. It's pretty straightforward one there. If you're offering a higher wage, you're going to have a higher supply of labour probably. The elasticity of supply of labour, very very similar definition to the previous one, I think I copied and pasted it so I hope I changed it to make it right. Um, basically the elasticity of supply of labour is defined as the responsiveness of quantity supplied of labour to a change in the wage rate. You calculate it by doing the percentage change in quantity of labour supplied divided by the percentage change in wage rate, wage rate even, <laughs> and it's determined by those factors down there. So the skills required, there's a lower elasticity of supply for skilled jobs because it takes longer for people to get the skills needed and there are fewer people that have the skills needed in order to supply the labour. So say there was a sudden increase in demand for professors, um, it would take a lot longer for people to sort of become professors and get those skills, whereas there's an increase in demand for a less skilled job, I don't know cleaning, I don't know if it needs skills or not, but typically defined as a less skilled job, uh, you're going to be able to have a much quicker increase in supply for that. The next one is training length. So there's a lower elasticity of labour supply for jobs with long training because people think, oh, I don't want to do all that training for the job. 
Uh, next one is vocational. Jobs with non-financial rewards, teaching, nursing, that sort of thing, tend to have a more inelastic labour supply because people aren't suddenly going to think, oh, I really want to do that job if the sort of main reward, the non-monetary factor reward, playing a part in that job is going to be something that they're not interested in. They're probably either connected with it or they haven't. Incidentally, I think teachers, 50% drop out after the first two years. That could be a total lie. Yeah, it was. It's five years. The first five years, I think it's a sort of general idea or general belief. It's obviously quite hard to measure, but generally teachers 50% drop out in the first five years. Fun fact of the day. Next one is time period. Labour is obviously more elastic in the long run because there's people who've had time to get trained and that sort of thing. Here we see the backward bending supply curve for labour, which I think is a really snazzy curve. And it basically shows the sort of number of hours people are going to be working in relation to their wage. So at first, as your wage rises, you have this sort of incentive to work for longer because you get more for each hour. This is called the substitution effect of a wage increase. So you work more hours because the opportunity cost of leisure increases. So say you spend an hour working instead of an hour playing football. When you're on £5 a week, that's not as much compared to £10 a week. £10 a week? £10 an hour. Sorry about that. And then when you get to B, from that point onwards, you sort of see the income effect of a wage increase. So you can work fewer hours for the same pay. So say you're earning 50000 a year and then your um, wage goes up, so you're earning more each hour. You can work for fewer hours for the same amount and because you see 50000 as a sort of comfortable level, you don't feel the need to keep increasing the amount you're working, the number of hours you're working, just to get more money because you need to sort of take leisure time into account as well. And those are two really interesting concepts and very easy just to slip in. The concepts are written out just here, in case you didn't catch what I was saying. I kind of forgot I had that slide made, but there's the income effect, so you can work fewer hours for the same pay, and the substitution effect, so individuals can work more hours as the opportunity cost of leisure increases. Woo! That is the end of the demand and supply of labour. Join us next time for the labour market wage determination, which is kind of interesting because wages and the amount people get paid is always interesting. So is inequality, I think that's a bit later. But then it's... One of the more difficult ones, I think, with that monopsony diagram. Monopsony and the trade unions, a bit confusing. But see you then for that. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. <laughs>